This is the Ridge Hunter Outdoors Podcast. Hey everybody, this is episode 20. I'm Canyon Clark here with Scott Clark tonight. Uh, we got a couple things we're going to go over tonight. One of them being an article by Clint McCoy. Uh, we did an article by him a few weeks ago out of North American Whitetail. And then another little bit of news that I guess is kind of inherently political, but not necessarily in the sense of the left versus right stuff that you see on the news every day. But it's something we uh, need to keep an eye on, and as hunters we got to be aware of these types of things not even necessarily this one if, if it doesn't affect you but uh, there was a, another one in another state that i'd seen recently that kind of got my attention so i want to go over it and then we'll get into the article so uh that i saw a post on facebook from a gretchen steel i don't know who she was it was shared on a on a page i'm on but she typed for those that participate in the various types of hunting contests, please be aware there is a currently a bill that's been introduced in Illinois legislature that would prohibit those contests. I know that many areas, these are popular events, thinking of one held in this area recently, and for some community organizations, they are fundraisers and community events. Regardless of your stance on this type of activity, keep an eye on this bill. And then she goes on and cites at least part of the bill. Um, it's HB 4372. Synopsis as introduced amends the wildlife code, prohibits contests or competitions with the objective of taking any fur-bearing animal, provides an exception for field trials, provides that a person who violates the new provisions is guilty of a Class A misdemeanor and subject to a fine of no less than $500 and no more than $5,000 in addition to other statutory penalties. Uh, essentially, what that's getting at, at least around here, would be all the coyote competitions that you see um, whether it be, like she said, a fundraiser or a community event kind of thing. There are a lot of those that go on in the southern part of the state, at least, um, with the, the coyote competitions, and I assume there's probably some for squirrels and rabbits and whatever, so that would prohibit any of those. Uh, Along with your deer competition, obviously. Well, yeah, I don't know if that would deer be... Deer contest? I don't know if it prohibits any... Yeah, I didn't, yeah. See, I didn't even think about that. All I'm thinking of uh, like a numbers thing, you know what I mean? But yeah, right. but yeah, prohibits contest. Where's it at? Prohibits contests or competitions with the objective of taking any fur bearing animal. So yeah, I guess it would be that too. Absolutely. So your big buck contest would be gone, like the one we just held. Right. Um, right. All that kind of stuff. Uh, so I I looked this up, and you're right. It's right now it's House Bill forty three seventy two. It was filed on the sixth of January by Representative Anna Mueller. Uh, she found a co-sponsor on the 12th, Jennifer Gong Gershwich, which um, I don't need to necessarily tell you what party they're from, um, but it had a first reading on the 21st of January. It was referred to Rules Committee on the 21st as well, and it's also been assigned to an Agriculture and Conservation Committee which is just all procedural at this time. That was on the 1st of February. So it's essentially went through about a quarter of the way through what it has to go through in the House. And, and now that's the easiest 25%. So it may never go any farther. It could take years or it could sail right on through. It just depends on uh, how many more co-sponsors and what all, what all games they play. But definitely we'll keep an eye out for it. Yeah, and I think here in Illinois with as many... Um, you know, as many people that represent us in this state that are against the kind of stuff that we do uh, as far as hunting goes, uh, it's something to keep an eye on. Hopefully, like you said, it just kind of dies. But Well, if you're, if you're bored, you should look these two representatives up and see some of the kind of bills that they sponsor and co-sponsor. Mm -hmm. It's a classic. Yeah. And like I said, just because they introduced it and got she got one you know, co-sponsor doesn't mean anything necessarily yet, but it's at least in the process so definitely something to keep an eye on and it would not surprise me at all if something like that did come down at some point right um the other one i was thinking of uh, there was i think it was tennessee uh it was a guy that introduced a bill to basically get rid of a bunch of public ground uh, for hunting uh whether uh, some kind of wildlife area i don't obviously i don't think it was federal ground it was state ground of some sort 
that you could public hunt down there, um, basically for development or business or housing. I don't remember exactly what it was, and I couldn't find the bill, so who knows what happened to it, if it's still going on or not. But anyway, those two things, I don't think we think a lot about that as hunters a lot because, you know, a lot of hunting is maybe an escape from that kind of stuff, but uh, you definitely got to keep an eye on it. And we have a voice, like she said, you know, as hunters, we have a pretty big voice. And that was a lot of talk even in this last election. I forget how many millions, 13 million or something, I, I don't know the exact numbers. I don't want to say it and be wrong, but millions of hunters that were registered in the United States, but only a small percentage of them were out voting. And with as many uh, policies being pushed now about gun control and all this habitat stuff, uh, the wildlife protections, and then trying to take away from what we do, it's really important that we get registered and we get out there and vote. Uh, that was, a, like I said, a big push in this last election. But And even if it's not voting, you know, writing your representatives, emailing them, whatever that may look like, giving them phone calls. Something to make your voice heard because uh, we don't want to be the silent majority in an issue that ends up costing us like these competitions or a whole bunch of public ground that we could hunt. Um, I think the last administration did a really good job of opening up a bunch of ground, and I'd hate to lose that because we don't want to say anything or ruffle any feathers. So, And, and we just have our heads in the sand and don't want to look at it because it's politics. Like I said, it's kind of inherently political, not that we want to get into too much politics on this podcast per se, but definitely something to keep an eye out for. I'm, I've just looked that up. There's an article here that says 30 to 50% of the hunters don't vote. Yeah, which is uh, stupid. Yep. If you're worried about your ability to hunt with firearms, especially uh, your ability to hunt public ground, that's the only way a lot of people hunt, and we talked about it with Steve last week, me and Nate did, about public land hunting. Uh, there's millions of acres across the United States where people hunt on public ground because they just don't have the private ground like what other people do. Uh, and maybe that's just what they like to do better. Maybe they could have private ground, but they just want the challenge of hunting public. And uh, if you don't get out and vote, you know, it, it could end up biting you in the end, not only on the firearms thing, but with all that, you know, uh, wildlife ground and, and that and even if it's not you know people pushing for development and stuff they may just be putting more protections on it where you can't hunt it uh, there's a lot of stuff that you know goes on at that you know at that level too so definitely a little over, a little over 15 million registered hunters yeah okay so i was thinking 13 so i guess it was close but 15 million of them and and half of them seven and a half million you know up to, up to seven million. and a half million of them aren't voting which yep. is the difference in an election some years, you know, especially absolutely different in local elections. Oh yeah, state elections, no question. Yeah. Half of voting population, and well, you know, you take a look at the Midwest where there's a pretty high density of hunters. You take fifty percent of that number, and yeah, you're definitely looking at differences in elections. And if you don't think that affects you, it definitely does at the local level. Uh, even as deer hunters, um, or coyote hunters, or squirrel hunting, whatever you do, and fishing as well. So. Keep an eye on those kind of things, and if anything does come from that, we'll try to keep you updated. Um, like I said, I try to look at those things every chance I get. Uh, if it's something that's, you know, well, I think it's not necessarily a good thing for us or our community. So, But that said, we'll move on now to the article I had picked out. Like I said, we did one on uh, by Clint McCoy a few weeks ago, and I don't remember. I think it was the still hunting article, maybe the last one we did of the actual deer season. He's the guy from up in middle eastern Illinois that we mm -hmm. talked about before. But this one is called The Winter Warrior, and it's focused on winter scouting. So similar to what we talked about the week before last on scouting this time of year and how beneficial it can be. He says instead of falling into a postseason depression, use late winter as your time to scout for whitetail. So I'll kind of pick through this article, and we'll talk about some of it Um you know, the benefits of scouting this time of year and what he says and our thoughts on it. So he starts out, I'm a total do-it-yourself hunter. I've been that way since boyhood when my uncle Michael helped me tag my first deer by loaning me his Ithaca model 37 deer slayer and three slugs. He once pointed to the tin ring on a photograph of a buck in this very magazine and said, this is where you want to aim. The lesson on field dressing came later, and that was about all the formal education I had on the subject. So basically I gave him a gun, pointed him in the right direction, and said, here you go. There you go. Knock yep. yourself out. 
It says, but I was hooked as a kid, and I thirsted for big buck knowledge. Present day, 42-year-old me hasn't changed one bit. Yes, I'm slower and a bit more weathered, but I still feel the same pull. I still want to better understand deer, and the learning curve never truly ebbs. I enjoy being a student of the woods, and there is one area of study I take almost as seriously, seriously as hunting during November, winter scouting. When our season closes here in the Midwest, the war of winter, work and study begins. Um, he goes on, he says, prioritize. Bitter winter weather makes it easy to sleep in on an off day, but if I want to take a trophy buck next fall, I need to define my priorities. I only want to sleep in when it's warm, but I may need to adjust stand positions. I may need to know more about a particular buck I didn't tag or perhaps investigate an area that housed the one I did. Sometimes I should shoot my bow more or perform maintenance on my firearms. The winter off-season is a great time to complete these tasks. In my home state of Illinois, there are 257 days between the close of January deer hunting and its opening again in October 2022. That means 70% of the calendar year is the off-season. We've all heard that old phrase, a scout more than you hunt. The simple math here makes this sage advice statistically significant for the would-be trophy taker. Therefore, my wintertime priority is scouting the timber for next fall as soon as season closes. And we talked about that uh, a little bit a couple weeks ago, where this would be one of the best times of the year to get out there and do it. And it's one of the reasons we like walking properties this time of year is because you can see everything and you can get an idea of what they were doing this past fall. And he'll talk a little bit about that. Um, he does give a word on shed hunting, he says here, and I want to talk about that for a second. Uh, I was hoping... Jeff and Nate would be here to discuss this part of it too because I wanted to get their opinions on it. But Every year on social media, I am floored by the number of posts made by folks out shed hunting in January and early February. If your priority is finding as many sheds as you can each year, there's nothing wrong with that. My personal take on early shed hunting is simple. It is folly. No doubt, if one finds a huge shed antler, it's proof the bucks carrying it lived up to the antler dropped until the antler dropped. That doesn't mean the animal will see next fall. I find one to two dead bucks with open skull pedestals nearly every winter. A fallen antler is just one data point toward where a buck chooses to live, and that data point is often discovered in open fields where bucks frequent to feed. In my area, almost every ag field, is one, there is one or two sets of ATV tracks tracing the perimeter of hardwood timber by the middle of February. This tactic may add to a shed pile, but it adds little to my useful hunt knowledge. I choose to separate scouting and shed hunting into two separate activities for best results. The first four to six weeks of the off season, I usually spend scouting, and then I'll end up, then I'll shed hunt hard until spring green up. So he's almost not that he's discrediting shed hunting, but and I kind of agree with him that it's not as important as doing the scouting, um, like finding the trails and the beds and the rubs and all that early on in the winter, because you know those sheds most likely will still be there after you can't see the other stuff that's there now oh yeah absolutely they're not going to go anywhere they may get chewed on a little bit but they're not going anywhere the sheds won't go anywhere right and like you said just because that you know that shed was dropped yeah that deer at least lived up to that point doesn't necessarily mean he's still around he may get hit by a car might die from the winter might get chased down by coyotes you know anything might get poached uh, anything um so it's, it's kind of a good data point like he talks about because you know that buck was in that area. If he does come back, at least he was there for when he dropped that antler. Um, and I do think, you know, it makes sense to put more value on the beds and stuff and then the scrapes and rubs that you find because that to me tells me he was definitely spending more time in there rather than maybe he's just passing through when he dropped his antler. So he goes on... Um, he talks about some of the gear for the winter work, but we'll skip over that. Uh, most of it's pretty self-explanatory. Get a good pair of boots and dress warm. He says, The winter woods are full of info that is more discoverable than any other time, like we've said you know, over and over again, as far as seeing everything. If I can get this page to turn. He says, well-used deer trails are worn into bare earth or appear as trenches in the snow. Bedding positions are easily seen as deep depressions in leaf litter or snow. Natural browsing activity is extremely notable in native browse species that have been nipped off by hungry whitetails. Oak flats that had a good mast yield will be littered with empty acorn caps. 
Don't be surprised to bump deer out of thermal cover in low areas of south-facing slopes or thick cover sheltered from winter winds by cedar or pine trees. Frequented creek crossings or fence jumps will be not notched or dented into the ground more than those sporadically. Use sporadically. Transition trails from bedding cover to destination feeding areas are very visible and, with no foliage on the trees, you can observe how they bend around contours. There are three specific pieces of sign that really get my attention. The first is a large singular deer bed with typical buck bedding structure and perimeter rubs. This assuredly is an antlered animal's bedroom. Whether the sign belongs to a mature buck remains unknown. And if a snow is on, track measurements can help size up the animal, so can measuring the size of the bed itself. Um, So that one right there is something we look for, or at least I look for when I go, you know, walk up property with a client and you can generally tell a buck bed from a doe bed generally with a doe bed there will be several beds close together Uh, you know during the fall they're obviously grouped up whereas the bucks will be grouped up you know in their bachelor groups in the summer their fall beds are going to be pretty far apart they're not going to have a lot of beds around them unless it's a couple two or three of the exact same size where he's been getting up and laying on different spots in that area another thing to look for like he was talking about there generally be rubs around because he's leaving a scent around there and he might just get up and feel frisky and rub a few trees uh, while he's around his bedding too so um, there's a, a few ways like that to tell a buck's bedding from a doe bedding and that's I agree with him there that's I think that's one of the biggest things that you can look for now and easily see it especially now we got this snow on the ground right now in the next few days uh, after it stops falling it starts to melt a little bit you'll be able to see pretty easily when you walk in the woods where a deer's been laying down if you're in the right spot yeah don't you think that right now you'd be scouting more for inventory than for stand placement yeah because there's there's so much changes be it food uh weather cover all those things change from you know october Mm -hmm. to now or from now to october so to me, you'd be scouting for inventory more so than, okay, he's here today. I'm going to put my stand up here in August. <laughs> right. Right? But I think you, yeah, I think you can get an idea, though. It'll be, you'll at least know you're in his home range. So you may not necessarily want to sit up there for, like, near that bed for October, November. But you'll at least know that, okay, he's at least in this area. So if you could find, you know, another couple locations like that around, maybe you start to nail down where he's actually living through the year. Um, I think maybe if you find some like that kind of buck bed where you've got some older rubs that look like they weren't made recently, you might mark that one as a bed he was using in November as opposed to right now. Um, but like with the snow and stuff that they're using right now, it's yeah, probably going to be different than, you know, you know, early season and then in November too, just because of that, you know, they're not, Some of the cover is going to be the same, but as brutally cold as it is now, it's not like that in October. So they're probably not going to bed in the exact same place. Well, that's what I'm, that's where I'm, that's where I'm going with that. Yeah. So I think, yeah, it's definitely probably more for the inventory because you can get an idea of if you've got bucks living on you or not. And then, like I said, they have their core areas within their home range. So maybe you kind of can nail down a core area for the late season and then, expand that out to what would be his home range so i think you can kind of use it for both and he talks about dropping pins and stuff and using them for hunting next season but i think it really depends and some of them will probably bed in the same place right now as they would in november depending on what kind of foods around uh, that close to that bedding or what kind of cover it is exactly but like you could probably go either way well if you're dropping pins at least you have a starting place exactly this is what it looked like in january as opposed to not getting out there at all mm-hmm. and you're not hurting anything this time of the year you're, right you know you're not if you run them off you run them, you run them off it's, mm-hmm. and if you drop those pins say you find a bed and you drop a pin here and then you walk up on the other side of your property and you find another bed and you drop a pin and you find a scrape line in another place and drop a pin well then you're starting to get an actual visual based on those pins on your map of you know potentially that home range or movement patterns of the buck based on what you're seeing so it can kind of give you an idea of the general area you're going to want to be looking at next fall i think and then using cameras for that give you a good idea of that's another thing too you could always put a camera there and then 
decide whether you need to put a stand in there or not. I mean, nothing says you can't hang a stand in October or November if you're careful about it. Mm, right. So. And I, I think one thing we've not really touched on, this time of year you can see a lot more of the topo of the ground you're walking. You, I mean, hills and knolls and, and of course, obviously you can see a ditch or a cliff, mm-hmm. but you'd be surprised how much more property that you can see either rolls or lays this way or lays that way with all the cover gone and the leaves gone. So those are other things you can mark Mm -hmm. while you're out doing your, you can scout the the roll of the lay of the property, lay of the land too. Yeah, because they're going to use the terrain, you know, to cover from visual cover or thermal cover, whatever it is, you know, running the ridges and whatnot. Like you said, if you got a a property that looks really flat when all the vegetation's on, it may just be that in those low areas you have a little bit taller vegetation than you do in the higher areas, and it kind of looks flatter than it is. Not only that, you just can't see that far with all that stuff on. Or so. if you're seeing certain sign here and certain sign there, and you're thinking, well, why is it that way? You get an idea of the topo on there, and sometimes it might might make sense. Oh, right. oh okay, you know, there is kind of a ridge here, or mm-hmm. there is kind of a lull over there, or there's a knoll on the other side. Now, now I get it. Right. Yeah, that's definitely one thing you can see better now than you can at most other times of the year. Uh, but he goes on after the bedding. He says, the second hint a mature buck lurks in the area is what I call a rub yard. A rub yard is a small square area of timber that is usually concentrated with fresh rubs from current season with antler scars from seasons past. So he's looking at the fresh rubs mixed with the old rubs, uh, which we talked about before. You know, they use year over year, so it's a pretty good sign that a buck's consistently using that area if you've got fresh and older rubs. Um, he says these areas of sign need to be taken with a grain of salt because the area may simply be a communal travel corridor that's visited annually by many bucks during the rut. But it could also be the subway tunnel a monster buck has used for years to get between his bedding locations, especially if these trees are large in size or if they are aggressively shredded. And I had a note on that um, the guess is that a mature buck will make between five and 600 rubs uh, per year. <laughs> so, uh, like he said, it may just be that you've wandered into, you know, where a few bucks are crossing, and then there's no telling how many rubs could be in there because during that time of year, like during the rut and stuff, uh, when they're really pumped up on their testosterone, they're, they'll walk out and take them, you know, an hour to walk across 30 yards because they're just rubbing every tree that they come by and thrashing everything. So, like he said, take that with a grain of salt. But I thought that was an interesting note, like what he was talking about. Five to 600 rubs a year, that's pretty... That seems like a lot. Yeah. Um, they actually come from the QDMA uh, deer steward course that I'm in. Mm-hmm. Um, they were talking about that. Um the different ways they use that stuff and all that. And we probably, we'll do some episodes on that kind of stuff next, like when we get into next season of stuff, because there's a lot of good stuff about how they use their scent. And some of it, you know, already, some of it I thought was kind of interesting that I didn't, hadn't thought about and, and all that stuff. But anyway, he goes on to the, the third one. He says, another winter scouting find that gets me excited is locating a huge communal scrape in the timber. I go crazy over these. I use them not so much for hunting over, but for inventory in the timber with carefully placed trail cameras. During winter, if I find a bare dirt scrape the size of a manhole cover, free of all leaf litter with one or more twisted up licking branches overhead, I bust out my cell phone and go straight to taking notes. When I was on the property last weekend, I think it was last weekend, I was on a property with a guy, and we came across one of these that he'd had a standby, a big community scrape. And even in January... They're still using that thing all the time. I mean, he like he's talking about, you got the licking branches that are all twisted up and broken off, and then just a great big, you know, three foot spot. Is that why the stand was there? Out. I mean, he, he, I think so. He had it there because yeah. of the scrape. Did he, he yeah. didn't do any good on it, or the, it was an area where he'd been, he'd seen some bucks. Uh, there was one that he'd passed on that he thought he'd give another year. He wasn't sure about, and then his neighbor ended up shooting it, not finding it. I think it lived in the end, but anyway. That was, you know, one thing that, like he's talking about, you can see definitely this time of year, and those stuff they'll use all year round. And then we were walking up another trail, and I was telling him about putting mock scrapes with his stands, like we do, tying a branch off and then throwing the rope over and, and creating a licking branch there, because the deer will use the licking branch even when they don't paw the ground. 
We've seen that on trail camera and even just hunting over them. Even if they that scrape that you made, that mock scrape's covered all up with leaves, uh, they'll still come in and hit that licking branch just because it's not pawed out doesn't mean they're not still using it. But anyway, I was telling them about all this and how to set it up and how to do it that way. And we come by a vine, one of those vines that had broke off and was hanging down out of a tree out over this trail, just like you'd tied it up with a rope. And I'll be dang, there was a big scrape underneath of it, <laughs> or they'd been using it. You're a regular genius, I think. <laughs> yeah. I said, that's exactly what I'm talking about right there with that. But anyway, uh, it was kind of funny how that worked out. But like he said, you know, you find those kind of things, those are definitely good to take note of. And like he said, put a camera on, because even if you're not going to hunt them, because good, good inventory, a good yeah, place to take inventory. Yeah. Right. Because even though, you know, scrapes will be used in more daylight hours than rubs, but they're still majority used at night as well. So even if you're not going to set up and hunt over that particular community scrape or whatever, put a camera on it, and then you get, you know, most of the bucks in that area are going to use that scrape because that's how they're communicating. Yeah, especially if you got a cell camera. Put mm-hmm. it up there, and then you're not disturbing everything. You're not having to pull your card. You're not leaving your scent in and out of there. Get your camera up and get out and stay out mm-hmm. for as long as you can. And it's a great way to take inventory Yeah, and, and not disturb anything if you if you have a cell camera. Right. And there was another thing, you know, that I'd taken some notes on here recently. They, they'll actually use those scrapes. The bucks will go in and use them and leave their scent to try to get the does uh, kind of all together in their ester cycle. I, can't, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is, but they'll try to get them all in the same ester cycle. And the benefit of that obviously is because they can breed more, but if they're all esters at the right time, then those fawns will be born more at the right time and it increases the survivability and all that. But they'll use those scrapes for uh, leaving their scent all year. And then during the rut, they use them, you know, kind of for the, well, pre-rut, they'll use them for that purpose, kind of trying to get the does, talking to the does and all that. But anyway, he goes on, he says, take thorough notes. So like he just said, getting out his phone, uh, he says, back in the day, I had to remember all this information until I got back to the house. A local print shop made me a large map of my hunting area and laminated it. This allowed me to draw on it with dry erase marker, and I'd write scouting notes in a notebook. 20 years later, it's all in my pocket. I use my smartphone and the Onyx Hunt app to do this now in real time wherever I'm at. I can drop a GPS-specific pin for certain types of sign and make notes on the area. I'll use this app to map any sign of interest. Where I put a tree stand pin, I'll put a reflective tack in a tree where allowed so I can find it easily in the dark. I'll map potential new trail camera locations and revisit them next summer or early fall. One new smartphone tool I've used in the last two years is a voice recorder. I'll talk into it as I find a very strong winter sign and dictate some of the finer details of what I put onto my Onyx map. At the end of the day, I'll name these audio clips under one single file for each location, date it, and revisit it as needed next summer or fall. This helps to connect the pinpoints and notations, especially months after taking them. So we talked to Steve a little bit last week about how much he uses the maps and stuff, and he essentially said he does. He really doesn't use them all that much. I don't know. I was going to ask him if he used Onyx for putting pins and stuff where he does find stuff on the ground, but he doesn't use aerials a lot. He'll go in and he likes to walk it because obviously he said there's a lot of stuff you can see on the ground you can't see from a map which is similar to why we go walk a property with a client rather than just doing everything off the map. Um, but I, me and Nate talked, and we both like using Onyx kind of for what he's talking about. You walk in there, you do your boots on the ground scouting, and you find something, you just drop a pin right on it, and it's saved there like we were talking about. You can get a visual of that, and then you don't have to remember where you put the tack in the tree. You know, right, well, you're where using you're the map as a map, not, yeah, yeah. right. And you still get your, you still got to walk the property, boots on the ground and all that. You're not using the map instead of walking. You're using the map while you're walking to, to mm-hmm. locate. Yeah. And we, like, we use that to marking stuff on client properties, whether it be potential stand locations we like or food plot locations or, you know, trails, rub lines, scrape lines and all that. But so when you guys were scouting places back in the day, you got new property to hunt. You just walk around and <laughs> just walk around. We didn't have maps or onyx or pins or didn't even know how to spell GPS back then. Yeah, you know, yeah. You, know, you kind of went back to your old instincts and you know look at your uh, oak flats and your ridges and well, you food and of course we're, you're talking 
pre-food plots way back in the day when I first yeah. started too. So it was what food was available. And of course, you're in an agriculture area, but uh, that mattered. Water, mm-hmm. uh, especially in the dry season, you always kind of said, okay, well, this stream runs dry and this doesn't. And, and that's what that's what we did. Yeah, you were you doing most of your and then we, doing, strigi- we strategically placed stands for your mother. <laughs> yeah, you because guys of that. doing most of your scouting like uh, with the intent of hanging a stand soon after that, though probably. Yes, or at least deciding like this was in the fall or at least the late summer most oh, yeah. of the time. Yeah, you went out there a couple of weeks before season. Yeah. yet so, yeah, that's a good place to put a stand up. Yeah, right. Which there's Chain value in that too, tree, you know. And there's value in that too, but. It's not like we you were deer. Yeah, it's not like you were walking out there in February and then trying to remember all that stuff. No, no, the no, next no, fall. No, no, yeah. Which apparently he was doing. He was just doing it like what he said with the Basically, laminated map and taking notes. The only time, the only scouting we ever did pre September was there was a couple different woods we used to shoot three D targets in. And you know, if you go out there and set up some targets and kind of remember that deer trail or mm-hmm. or that scrape or that rub line when you're setting up targets in that particular woods but other than that i didn't really think about going out there and doing other thing right so we'll finish up the article here he says take early action why wait for summer heat and full foliage to do your deer work when it can be done in the winter and i'll add a note why wait for the turkey mites and the mosquitoes <laughs> <laughs> Some winter days, I'll work on pulling tree stands or doing other grunt work, like trimming out a creek bed for sneaky entry route. Other days, I'll take a slower approach, and I'll scout and map the important sign in a pragmatic, in as pragmatic a pace as I can muster. In conclusion, winter scouting can pay big dividends. When you become a student of the woods, yes, it's cold, yes, it's work, but this past fall, I scored on a mature buck with, a large, with large brow tines and a narrow wooded draw that I had scouted last winter. The work I did in and around that little patch of cover on a single-digit day in February 2021 proved pivotal. Pivotal. I measured a set of big buck tracks in the snow and let out of the draw to the north that day. I backtracked them to a buck bed. Then I picked out a scrubby little tree to climb that would cover three main trails near it in tight cover. In November, I hung a stand in that same tree using map pins and notes from about eight months earlier. And the first morning sit produced a close-range shot on a buck just after sunrise on our firearm opener, which is actually the deer uh, in the article picture. That one there's the one he's talking about. Um, so in that instance, he did find something in you know this time of year that ended up helping him in November. Uh, whether it was that buck that was used in that bed the year before, or whether he just found a spot where there had been bucks and ended up killing that one because he was in the right area, you know. Who knows? But I obviously lends itself to the scouting this time of year. No question. Yep. So that kind of finishes up the article there. Um, I guess that that'll pretty much do it. We're have obviously be kind of a shorter show tonight, unless you got anything else you want to go over. Um, so next week, hopefully, I don't know when Jeff's coming back. Hopefully, Nate will be back. I'm sure he'll try to be. Uh, we got some pretty good weather came in. I'm sure a lot of you guys did too wherever you're listening at here in the midwest we got some pretty good snow that came down so nate didn't want to make the drive down to our official studio so he could record with us but like i said that'll wrap it up for this week um we are going to be up with the iowa deer classic march 4th through 6th i believe our booth is 305 i'll be posting that information on our social media so you guys if you're going to be up there if you guys are up there and you want to come chat you can stop by and talk to us we're going to try to record something up there, whether it be in the hotel room or, or at the show. Uh, we'll have to figure that out as we go, too. But And then we got the store getting closer every day to opening, waiting on a few things still yet. But, um, again, I'll be posting that stuff when that opens up. And that will be on our Facebook page, which is Ridge Hunter Outdoors, and then on Instagram, at Ridge Hunter OD, if you guys want to follow us there. And I would put out a post a couple days ago. I think it would be cool to do some – Q and A episodes. Um, if you guys got any questions, comment on our social post. You can go to our website, ridgehunteroutdoors.com, and there's a contact us field where you can send us an email, however you want to do it, and ask any questions you would want us to talk about on here. Um, and I thought I might supplement that too with some questions that you know, frequent questions we get on consultations and stuff from guys. 
think it might be good to mix in one of those every now and then if we can, um, especially as our audience grows and, you know, we get more people listening, you might have some more questions. So thanks for listening. Um, uh, like I said, this is a short podcast, but we'll probably have a normal one, normal length again next week. And it'll be out next Friday, so we'll catch you then. <laughs>